we're going to get started, and we're going to uh, hold all our questions until the end. And our first speaker, Dr. Stanley Goldenberg, why does it seem like hurricanes are getting stronger and more destructive? Okay, I always get an honorary PhD at these conferences. But uh, uh, first of all, it's just an incredible privilege any time to speak at a uh, Heartland conference. I'm very grateful for all the work they do, and I love to, uh, to be here. And we're talking about why does it seem, that's the key word, like hurricanes are getting stronger and more destructive. It's a matter of M, and M, and M, and M. So that's what's going to be the, uh, the flow of this talk. So let's talk about the first M, me. So <laughs> to learn a little bit about me, first of all, I am here on my own time, and the views I present here do not necessarily represent those of my employer, the federal government, or NOAA, although I will say that most of the stuff I'm presenting are things that either is based on my personal research or experiences and things that I've checked into, and many people know agree with it, but I have to do that disclaimer, uh, and that's not because NOAA's given me a hard time, by the way. And uh, so anyway, I've had a lot of these slides, by the way, I'm gonna go very quickly. You can watch the video later and slow it down if you need to. But I'm gonna try and get through a lot of material and lots more, I, all of us would love to share much more, but I squeezed in whatever I could in this short period of time. And in my career at the Hurricane Research Division, which has had different names through the years, I have interacted with numerous hurricane scientists, uh, visiting scientists, I mean, uh, tops in their areas of expertise. I've had personal research with the forecast models, climate studies. I participated in the field program, flying out, uh, gone through the eye over 100 times, flown around storms, many, many uh, flights, uh, and firsthand knowledge of how the data are used to determine the position and intensity of hurricanes, quality control, and final finalized. I'm also part of the NOAA Seasonal Hurricane Outlook team that tells you what we think is going to be for the hurricane season. And by the way, I have to tell you that when I brief our uh, headquarters at OAR uh, each time before the press release, I say, now I don't know if our outlook will be correct, but one thing I tell you with 100% certainty is if there is a devastating storm out there this year, someone will blame it on man-made climate change. And I'm right every year. So, and also I experienced the full blunt of Hurricane Andrew. Uh, and I always have to show this picture, and you can actually see the story on a geographic special at that link below. I had a baby 12 hours before the eye wall destroyed our storm, before it destroyed our house, and I was in the house with my brother and sister-in-law, their three sons, and my three sons. So it was quite an experience. Uh, now, this might not ha seem to do with climate, but there's a reason I want to show this slide. And can we reduce the intensity of hurricanes? Well, I was there when they were doing Project Storm Fury, where they were going out there and seeding the storms. Those are just the different names of our organization. And attempts to create a weaker outer eye wall. This is basically to do an artificial, what we call, eye wall replacement cycle, just to reduce the winds by even 10 or 20 miles an hour, which could greatly reduce the damage. It was abandoned in the early 80s. This has gone on for decades. Really careful science science, but they finally, and uh, lots of funding for this, but our lab had enough scientific integrity when they saw that the theory, which you had to have super cold water uh, at certain high altitudes for us to seed, uh, was not going to work. And also, as you can see with this plot of Hurricane Allen, where it went Cat 5, Cat 3, Cat 5, Cat 3, Cat 5, Cat, this was the first storm I dealt with on a professional basis. And there was just so much natural availability to distinguish it would take incredible amounts of experiments, but the main thing was the theory did not hold water, and w our director wrote the kind of RIP article for Project Storm Fury. That's what we call scientific integrity. Um, and I'm glad to be at HR. It's a real honor to work at the Hurricane Research Division. I've been there over 40 years, and I'm gonna retire someday. Uh, so let's talk about another end, meanings. What are the definitions? Uh, confusion of terms. Now, I like using AGW a lot, anthropogenic global warming, otherwise known as Al Gore warming. Uh, and then there's anthropogenic climate change. I avoid saying plain old climate change when I'm talking to people, because that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about man-made or anthropogenic. If you ask me, do I think the climate is changing? I said the climate's always changing. So anthropogenic, man-made, Global warming, climate change, whatever, is not the same as just global warming or climate change or climate. People are getting used to, are you worried about the climate? And they're talking about climate change, anthropogenic climate change. And just because you have fluctuations doesn't mean it's AGW. Just because you have weather, that doesn't mean it's AGW. This is an important key that inconvenient truth, 
the COPs, the Greta, all that, and most of them, they're talking about CAGW or CACC. In other words, catastrophic. They're not talking about minor stuff. We're all going to die. So fact is there's numerous scientists, which we know well here, who don't expect catastrophic as you did, but agree we can experience catastrophic climate change. There's certain changes in climate, natural fluctuations can have tremendous impact. And I'm not addressing the issue of whether ACC, AGW is happening. I'm addressing the issue of even if it is happening, whatever is causing different climate fluctuations, is it affecting hurricane activity through the years? So let me talk about the third one, my story. How did I come to have my eyes open in this area? Now, my research was mainly in tropical climate in general and hurricanes and climate. I'm not an expert in the AGW area. So like many other meteorologists, I basically initially accepted those theories. Oh, yeah, more CO2, warming, greenhouse, all that. But then after the hyperactive 2004 hurricane season, a well-known climate scientist who we grew up in school knowing, Kevin Drembert, calls a press conference to declare that we are now seeing the increase in hurricane activity caused by you know, anthropogenic global warming. And I and some other, we said, whoa, wait a minute. There's no study. There's no paper. There's nothing that would support this. And then I started to realize hurricane conclusions from the IPCC were warped. In fact, a very famous resignation letter talks about that from Chris Lancey. And then the light bulb moment. If they're do I remember this exact thought. If they're doing this with hurricane data, I wonder if they're distorting the overall general climate stuff. And then like many others, including my good friend, Dr. Neil Frank, former director of the Hurricane Center, spoke at the last conference, I started to look into it. And this is what happened. When Toto pulls back that curtain, someone else showed this. And what's the first thing the wizard says? Everybody, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And he closes it again, but it is too late. And that's what happened to most of us. Once we saw it, it's like, forget it. You start to see all the garbage and all the distortions going behind the scene. Then I was asked to debate, by, to debate someone trained by Al Gore. And my wife was urging me to do this. And I said, no, no, it's not my field of expertise. And she convinced me. So I started studying, watching Convenient Truth, searched online, discovered some of Lord Mockton's materials. Uh, great stuff. Saw the great global warming swindle with tin ball and so much more. And I realized this is a piece of cake. And the debate was easy, because once you have the curtain pulled back, it falls like a pack of cards. Then I was invited to the first ICCC in 2008, meeting many other scientists, and the rest is history. So now, on to the next step, measurements. This is probably one of the biggest keys. If you want to see a, a video of, of the flight I filmed into Hurricane Katrina was hitting land, that's the link for that. So measurements, it's, it, this is probably the most important thing. It's the problem using the historical tropical cyclone database. Temporal non homogeneity. It's always changing. We're always improving. We're always changing how we're measuring. Before 1944, all you had was ship obs. And in fact, way before that, you didn't even have radio communication. You know what they were getting until they came back into the court from, into uh, port from their logs. And also, the ships avoided the stronger hurricanes. <laughs> they knew from the waves they weren't going to go through the middle of a Cat 5 hurricane. So you didn't measure a lot of the stuff out there. The land knobs depended a lot and evolved. The aircraft, who started in 1944, how they measured in the 40s and the 50s, vastly different. I mean, I've been flying since 1980, and the amount of changes and evolution and how we're measuring is enormous. In, in the 50s, they would have people in a bubble in the bottom looking at the waves on the surface, trying to decide how strong the storm was, come back, and then their leading officer would say, commanding officer would say, no, that's too strong. And I mean, it gets get better and better and better, in fact, Besides the planes, we have had the big drones that fly at 65,000 feet. We have smaller drones that fly near the surface. There's now balloons that we're controlling going up and up. Just more and more measurements all the time. Ocean measurements are changing. Improvements in the land observation. Satellites, continual satellite coverage didn't start till the end of the 60s, but satellite coverage then is vastly, vastly different. It's always, always changing. So in fact, uh, Dvorak, who just passed away recently, uh, he um, came with technique, a technique to know the strength from the uh, satellite. Uh, but then in the 80s, you got infrared satellite. So that even changed and evolved. Then you have spatial non-homogeneity. It's like different, different hurricane basins. They measure differently. Earlier, depending on ship, tra ship tracks, it depends uh, where the aircraft. There's so many changes. I can't go into all these, but many of the alleged AGW-related increases or trends 
interesting match the data measurement changes as well. I once was interviewed by the New York Times and uh, they were asking about a certain paper that came out and I said, this is just one of a parade of studies based on a misuse of the historical database. And I still say that to this day. So this just shows all the different uh, measurements and you see where uh, continual satellite coverage uh, started, but so many improvements through the years. This is one of my favorite slides by Chris Lancey uh, from 2007. And what it shows is the percent of tropical cyclones in the US hitting land each year. So you look before reconnaissance and there were many years 100%. That means they did not know the storm was there if it didn't hit land. Then as soon as you get reconnaissance, you have a lot of years without 100%. And as soon as you get satellite, forget it. It doesn't get anywhere near that. Uh, did, the, did the activity change? And were they changed? Maybe more used to hit land? I mean, come on now. Uh, anybody with half a brain can know this is a change in observations, not a change in activity. Uh, and then you look at a year like 2005 versus 2000, 1933, both incredibly active years. But before satellite and aircraft OBS, uh, 1933 season, nothing out there in the Eastern Atlantic. And I happen to know a prominent hurricane scientist who said, oh, that's because they've shifted as far as where they form now. I mean, hokey baloney. Uh, and then we have one of the favorite instruments, the GPS drop sounds. When these started being used in hurricanes in 1997 um, uh, in uh, Hurricane Guillermo, uh, did I say 1987 there? Oh, no, 1997. Uh, and I was there for that flight. Uh, I mean, it was like taking a CAT scan of these things. It, was, it just added so much to our data uh, to understand the winds, everything. In fact, the analysis of the eye wall, we started to see a better way to adjust the winds from the plane to the surface. And that's why they changed Andrew from a Cat 4 10 years later to Cat 5 because we reanalyzed the aircraft data. Uh, Hurricane Dorian in 2019, uh, you know, versus historical hurricane. So they said, the Hurricane Center said, it tied with the 1935 Labor Day hurricane for the strongest Atlantic hurricane landfall on record. But Dorian was measured, it was one of the, the most measured hurricanes out there by all the aircraft. And what did 1935 storm have? No aircraft, no satellites, very few OBS, no direct measurements. I, you can't compare stuff like that. But people make statements of, as far as that. I will go to the next, media. Okay, I have lots of experience with media, like some people here, local, national, international, print, radio, TV, even Conan O'Brien. You can see that. That's a real hoot uh, when they stuck me on that. So let's talk about the media. Why are they inaccurate? Okay. Sometimes it's just plain old ignorance. They don't know. They don't understand what you're saying. Sometimes it's sloppiness. They have time constraints. Have you ever been interviewed? They just throw the thing together. They don't want to know. They don't really care as long as you get their article out. Then there's the bias. They think they know. The Weltanschauung, worldview, they're colored glasses. So that's where it gets to be deliberate. And then there's deliberate lies. And sadly, it happens enough where they don't want you to know the tr truth. And the facts only matter uh, if they serves their agenda. And other facts they just toss out. Censorship. Lots of censorship. And many people here, we've experienced and seen that censorship in the media. Uh, recent example, Don Lemon, bless his heart, CNN is interviewing the acting director of the Hurricane Center. When Eon is about to clobber the southwest Florida coast, what does he care about? What effect does climate change have on intensification? Jamie says, you know, we can talk about climate change later. I want to focus on the here and now. Don later. Yeah, but what effect does climate change have? He had an agenda. You know, it seems these storms are intensifying. That's the question. Jamie, I don't think you can leak time. At the very end, Don is so frustrated. He just says, well, I grew up in Florida. I know hurricanes are getting stronger. So I emailed Jamie and I said, he's so smart. We should hire him. I mean, and then I had three interviews in Time Magazine. Two of them were centerfolds. I was in the centerfold of Time Magazine. Uh, and, and Madeline Nash, an excellent science reporter, uh, who we got her even on a hurricane flight, balanced article. She interviewed me and others and basically accepted the multi-decadal scale view that we talk about. Had some opposing views, very good article. 2004, she came back again, did another article. Then came 2005, someone else interviewed me. I still remember I was flying nights and I was like, oh, it's Time Magazine, I'll do this. And it was like I and two other real experts were stuck at the end as the skeptics uh, that were making hurricanes worse. And by the way, that cover was repeated in every version of Time Magazine. And usually they have different ones for different countries. They were gonna hammer this home. Uh, again, it was very biased. Then manipulated mindset. Okay, these are such good quotes. And I didn't put who they're from because there's disagreements who they're from. 
I got to read it. If you tell a lie big enough, keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield people from the political, economic, or military consequences of the lie. It just becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Boy, we see that in so many areas. And what I learned, the quote I learned, thank you. Oh, yeah. The quote I learned last time at the uh, last Heartland, it's much easier to deceive people than convince them they've been deceived. And we see that once they've heard something a hundred times, a hundred times, kids are in school have been have the mask thing drilled in their, in their head so far that parents can't even talk them out of it. It's just incredible. So let me go to the next M, the models. So what are the expected changes in hurricane activity from global climate models? Where they doubled the CO2 and you have all these kind of things. Current consensus, the overall number will decrease, but a slight, and that is slight. That increase is so slight that our current measurement devices might not even notice it. But there's going to be a slight increase of the stronger storms. So it has to be something bad, and they emphasize that. Uh, the key is it's not just the sea surface temperatures. You can have warmer sea surface temperatures, but a different atmospheric circulation, you don't get the same storms. And they usually say, we expect this. I always correct it if I'm reviewing an article. You're suggesting it. The model suggests it. You can't expect it. It's a non-verifiable hypothesis. Due to the observations, you have to wait for decades for it to happen. And of course, this conference shares all sorts of problems with the climate models themselves. Uh, let me go to modes. EOFs, multidecadal. Okay, so I love this uh, particular talk, the slide uh, from this paper. And what it is, it's three modes of empirical orthogonal function analysis, which is a great way of pulling out these different types of variability in data. So this is sea surface temperatures, global sea surface temperatures. And on the top, you basically have the global warming mode. In other words, there's a trend, a long-term trend uh, going up. Whatever it's from, there is a trend there in the sea surface temperature data. But it increases the vertical shear. It's associated with increased vertical shear, which rips apart hurricanes in the Atlantic. Therefore, you have a downward trend in US landfalls. Then you go to the El Nino mode, which is the middle one, three to seven years. That's when that's positive, that also increases the vertical shear in the Atlantic lower hurricane. The only one associated with increase is the Atlantic multidecadal mode. So you have a few decades favorable, unfavorable, favorable, unfavorable. It's decreased vertical shear, higher activity. So let me just show this. Uh, well, first of all, here's the uh, ACE index, which is an overall measure of hurricane activity in the Atlantic. So a lot of the studies I see, scientific studies, they start in the 70s and 80s. Some of you have a good reason for doing that. And they go into the present, and gee, you get a trend. Someone else, I think this was in the movie we saw uh, th Thursday night. But, oh, gee, what happened before that? And by the way, people look at, if you're an honest scientist, they say, you know, it looks more active in the current, ac the current high activity era than the previous one. And I say, that's before they had satellite. I mean, there was so much we didn't measure back there. I'm sure it was a lot more active, and that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, and by the way, this multidecadal mode is associated with these fluctuations, oceanic temperatures, particularly in the Atlantic, a uh, few decades up, down, up, down. And it's interesting that the um, proxies show the multidecadal signal for hundreds of years. Uh, and I got to wrap this up. And this is just shows it's a very robust signal, tremendous increases. And I. I just had to have this in there, just the Webster, just because it's published doesn't make it right. And he was saying that the number of cat fours and fives doubled. You can look at one of my older talks to see more about this. Doubled in the last 30 years. The trouble is that the, this was all before the Dvorak technique came out. As soon as it came out, it flatlined. Uh, and I'm, I'll skip that. So finally, more people in harm's way, I got one and a half minutes for this, is that the U.S. hurricane damage, so here's from the uh, early 1900s of the present, is it anthropogenic global warming, climate change? Oh, if you adjust it for population and value for all the property that's put in the way, it flatlines. Because it's not how intense a storm is when it hits, it's uh, where, how, when, you have Cat 4s and a Cat 3. Cat 4 Brett hit the least populated area of the Texas coast, 15 million, one death. And then you had Katrina, Eon, uh, and I'll skip the rest here so I can wrap it up. Andrew, if it had just been 15, 20 miles north, triple the damage. The yellow is where the devastation was. And you can see the population, the, the uh, value of land, so much more to the north. 
And just to sum it up, um, is that perception, what seems versus reality, if you carefully use the historical record, uh, you will see just cycles, no real trend. Uh, you have some in the media that just emphasize the anything bad has to be global warming. And uh, uh, they're not new. They're naturally occurring weather system. Man doesn't cause them and man can't stop them. And we need to continue to focus on improvements in tracking intensity models, understanding the threat, because hurricanes happen. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Thank you very much. I went six seconds over.